Hi, I'm Brian. Welcome to Autogafool and welcome to a very wet and decidedly autumnal Luxembourg. 2015 is when we first got a look at Porsche's concept car, the Mission E. And since then, we have all been waiting very patiently to see just how much of that concept could actually be brought to market in a standard production car. Well, today the wait is over. Here it is, the brand new Porsche Taycan Turbo S. And Woo Wow oh, Did that do to you what it did to me? <laughs> Right from the very first glimpse of this car, two things are immediately obvious. Firstly, Porsche wanted to define this as being an electric vehicle, but at the same time, they decided that it was very important. You could still see right from the get-go that it was a Porsche, and it features a lot of the classic design language, even some throwback references to some earlier designs. Now, the first thing that catches my eye down here are these air vents right at the side. The two reasons that I particularly like them. One, you might think they're just there for show, but thermal management is one of the most important aspects of an electric vehicle. So it's important that the airflow is moving around the car in exactly the way it's designed to. But secondly, these really remind me of the black markings at the side of the eyes on a cheetah. Cheetah, the fastest land animal. I think Porsche are making a subtle reference to that here. Well, the S version of this car boasts a zero to 100 kilometers per hour speed of just 2.8 seconds. So that puts it amongst pretty impressive competition. So the looks need to be able to say that it's gonna be capable of delivering to that expectation. One of the particularly nice design features of this whole new design language that the Taycan features is the way that angularity and roundness have been matched. If you look down at the bottom here, we have these carbon fiber details just below these air intakes again for the thermal management of those batteries but we still have this roundness in the bumper that we expect from the Porsche classic design again coming slightly higher up matched with that contrast of angularity if you look at this crease detail that runs right the way up the bonnet it really draws the eye up into the design of the car but again with the same big muscular rounded front that you've come to expect to know and love from Porsche so the use of contrast here really works well. It says this is something new, but it doesn't attempt to do away with what makes the brand so instantly recognizable and so popular. These new lights are LED and that is standard. If you want the Matrix version, that is optional and will of course cost you just a little bit more. Four meters 96 in length or 195 inches. This car is about nine centimeters. That's about that much shorter than the Panamera. So in terms of where it sits within the overall brand, it's larger than a 911, but it is smaller than a Panamera. Obviously the trick with electric cars is always at first glance, can you tell they're electric because they have to find a lot of space to store the batteries. Now recently we're seeing more and more SUVs coming out and they have more space to play with when it comes to this. But in a sports car, that's really very challenging, especially if you still want to be able to give people the sports car experience when they actually sit in it. Well, that's clearly a massive challenge from a design perspective. And I think what Porsche have done here is really very, very clever. 
you can definitely see there's more emphasis in the lower third with that skateboard style battery that has to go into the base but it hasn't bulked out the design. Look at this lovely sweeping roof life. It absolutely says Porsche through and through. This car really couldn't have been made by anybody else, but you don't damage that by having this additional bulk in the base. The runner, of course, helps that. This character line here and the nice high shoulder. Everything is tying together to give you a really stylish, fast appearance. Now, there are many different new wheel options coming out with this car. If you go with the S, you're gonna get the 21 inch, and that's what this is. But as with so many of the other design aspects of the car, you can see this lovely blade reference to earlier Porsches that have gone before. So they really are presenting this car as an evolution not a revolution. And stylistically, I think that's a really good idea. But what do you think? The rear of the sports car is often its signature for many people, and the Taycan is no exception. Now, the Taycan has a particularly interesting challenge, unique to electric cars. Yeah, come on, you know what it is. We don't have any exhaust ports, fake or otherwise. Why is that a challenge for design? Well, we're so used to seeing them that it presents us with something of a visual incongruity. We look at the car and think something's missing. So something has to be done design-wise in order that your eye isn't drawn to that feature. And here, you can see there is an LED strip that runs the entire width of this car. And that ties in not only these massive muscular shoulders, but also this more svelte, stylish midsection of the car. So you really don't miss that chrome feature in the bottom. Instead, we have an air diffuser down here, more carbon fiber detailing, and I would say a fairly subtle and discreet rear end. Okay, subtle and discreet for a sports car, but it's all finished off very nicely indeed. So for my taste, the back delivers on the promise that the front makes. But tell me, what do you think? Clearly the most important feature of an electric car is the relative ease of charging them. A lot of thoughts have been put into that here. We have these charging portals on both sides of the car, but it only has DC, that's fast charging, available on one side, and irrespective of which market you're in, that can be found on the passenger side of the vehicle. So here we are on the passenger side to open. I just need to swipe my finger across the bottom of that sensor. As you can see, it opens up really nicely. Now that's the AC part of the charging. When you put on the adapter for DC, it will connect to both of those. If you constantly use DC, you can of course remove this so you don't have to do that every time. When you're done with your charge, a quick swipe over and the door nicely shuts. Well, the keys are pretty standard affair if you're familiar with Porsche and isn't likely to upset or amaze anyone too much. Look down here. Now, when I first found out that the Taycan was going to have a similar handle design to the 911, I was a bit dismayed. Regular viewers may have seen our review of that car and the handles stylistically work extremely well. If you look at the way that the line fits in here, obviously that has a massive aerodynamic benefit, but it also looks and feels great. For my taste in the 911, that's until you actually touch the handle to open the door. But I was assured that that had been somewhat overhauled for the Taycan. And if you can hear this, it just feels a lot more solid. It's the same mechanism. Nothing here has changed radically. Now I'll lock that again so you can see. There we go, as it fits in and as it comes out. But the overall feeling of just using this is much more satisfactory than the 911, so I think that's a really nice tweak. First thing you notice when you open the door is obviously we have a frameless door design here. That certainly helps the stylish overall feeling of the car. 
and a nice, subtle, discreet interior greeting. So Taycan Turbo S embedded into the door sill, but it's done in a really nice, stylish way. So not overblown, not too much, just enough to say, hello, it's time to check out some driving. Door design again, nice and discreet, not overblown, very straightforward. But I'm always impressed when car manufacturers do well with their design of the space in these things. Now this is my water bottle I standardly take everywhere. It takes a liter, and as you can see, it really nicely slots in there well. That's brilliant. So many sports cars, you get in, you realize you have nowhere to put anything. Nice discreet design on the door, a good solid feel again to this door handle, which is pleasing to use and nicely integrated from a design perspective into the controls here. A couple of journalists that we've spoken to have said they found these controls a little bit further set back than they would like. For my body geometry, I find it works really well. And honestly, I'm prepared to sacrifice a little bit of that so I can get that extra space down here for storage. Here we have the sound system, also nicely integrated. That struck me as being something of a concern when I first saw it for vibrating against pencils or anything else that gets stuck down here. But I can tell you, we've put some significant volume through that and we haven't managed to find a single vibrating noise so far. More on that later. Regular viewers will know that one of our passions here at Autografool is trying to move towards more sustainable car interiors. And this is a fully vegan interior. That means no animal products whatsoever. Now, before everybody starts groaning and says, look, I like it, I don't have a problem with it. That's great. It's fine if that's what you're into, but it is really nice to see the manufacturers start offering an actual proper alternative for people who want to try something that bit more sustainable. And given that this car is all about sustainability, well, come on, as much as a sports car can be, it's nice to see that reflected in the interiors that are on offer. So what you're looking at is a fabric seat, very nicely finished in a conservative fashion. So if you need a little bit more pop, there are of course lots of different options. I like everything in a sports car to be low key, conservative and subtle. I'm there to drive it, not to get distracted by too much happening to me visually. Well, other than a little bit of mud from where we've abused it, the interior looks very nice indeed, but how does it behave once you actually get in there? Let's find out. Well, if that looked like a bit of a cramped entry, the first thing to mention is I do have unbelievably short legs. So the driver's seat here is a lot further forwards than it ordinarily would be. I'm five feet 10 or 178 centimeters in height. And as you can see, I have lots of headroom available here. What's slightly unusual about the Taycan is that if you go with the glass panoramic roof over the solid one, you actually get a little bit more headroom. In terms of the driving position for the Taycan, you have a very similar experience to the exterior visuals, which is to say that it falls very neatly between the 911 and the Panamera. You have a higher up road position than you would expect from the 911, but it's not quite as present and high up as the Panamera. Overall, all round visibility is excellent. Yeah, it's a big B pillar, but what do you expect? Come on. Other than that, I actually don't feel too low down at all. I feel just where I want to be which given the immense amount of power that this car promises is probably a very good thing. Now to the interior, and if I had to pick one word to describe it, it would have to be digital. Well, the first thing we have to talk about <laughs> the immense amount of real estate in terms of screens that there are in this car. The driver's display, as you can see, is a frameless curved one. It's 16.8 inches across. Over here, we have the driver's infotainment screen, and that is 10.9 inches. And rounding off the trilogy, 8.4 diagonally across, these are the driver's controls. Now, before we get onto all of that, take a look over here. This, I would say, so far, bizarrely to me, is the biggest opinion splitter of anything on this car. This is an optional passenger's second display. So 10.9 inches, same as the drivers. This allows your passenger to access all of the infotainment systems. It will not allow your passenger to change any of the car settings. So if you have a child here, they can't alter your drive while you're busy doing it. Now, a lot of people have been very critical of this. They think it's an irrelevance. Why would you want to pay more money for this? I personally think it's brilliant. Brilliant that was, until Jonas decided that it was capable of reprogramming our navigation system. So be warned, it is huge fun for your passenger, but they still do have the potential to ruin your life. Thanks, Jonas. 
It's worth spending a little bit of time talking about this. This is a huge leap in technology for quite a lot of reasons. If you've driven the new 911 or at least seen one, you'll be familiar with the idea of breaking the screen essentially into three different components in order to give it that wraparound feel. This is a big evolution in terms of how screen design works. Not only is it curved, but a huge amount of effort has gone on here to make this screen as lacking reflectivity as possible and make the viewing angle as highly adaptive to the driver as possible. I can tell you the driving experience of using it is excellent, but as in common with the 911, if Jonas comes back a little bit, you can see the glaringly obvious problem. Now, when you're driving, this isn't a big deal, but there is simply no way of positioning this steering wheel that will allow you access visually to all the information you really want to know about. A couple of particularly noticeable features, the temperature over here, you simply cannot see that while you're driving without moving your head. And then of course, over on this side, the time and your destination arrival time. Now that's not the end of the world. One thing that will be changing later on is there will be available head-up displays on this car. Unfortunately, for my way of thinking, it isn't launching with one. So if you're big on head-up displays, and I really like them in performance cars, you may want to think about waiting just a little bit longer until they come out as well. Meanwhile, the information that you actually do get is so well displayed and so nice to adjust. Having used an awful lot of these systems, I'm now going to show you a little bit on the steering wheel if Jonas comes back. Then I can tell you that some of them have far too much complication going on in the menus. This is really intuitive and straightforward. This, by the way, is one of the two new steering wheels available for this car. It's fantastic. It feels solid. It's nicely put together and it's really easy to work with. So look at this. If I want to change my display, if I press this button on the side, I can cycle between the three main dials that I have access to. And if Jonas can see that in focus, that is really obviously and nicely highlighted by a big orange circle. What do I do next? Well, by pressing the middle knurled wheel here, I can then have a range of options that I'm able to change for any one of those three. But what's really clever and intuitive about the way that this works is that rather than offering you the full range of menu options all in one go, it's broken down for each of the dials. Which means if you're getting used to the car, you don't have to cycle through a ton of menus and then feel irritated that you lost the bit you really wanted. You really can easily navigate back to where you were. And if you're driving and you want a little bit of additional information, it's very easy and intuitive to find it. So I have to say, I'm really impressed with the way that this has been integrated and worked out. And for me, it's more than enough that I actually don't care about those bits that I can't see while I'm driving. Further down the steering wheel, we have the drive mode selector. An awful lot on that more, a little bit later when we take it for a drive. And over here, we have a volume knob for the infotainment and of course the function to be able to speak to your car. This button bears a little bit of explaining. We have three different modes of potential recuperation for the energy on the braking available on this car as standard. You can switch it off. That means the car behaves exactly as you would expect a standard petrol car to do. You can switch it on. That means the car will absolutely take every single bit of regenerative energy it can from your braking. Or it has a third mode, which I think I should be able to show you there. There we go. If I press that for two seconds, you can see... I have my icon there, that tells me that it is now adaptive. So it uses a wide range of sensors to predict your behavior and therefore have the least impactful experience for you while driving. You can really hope to get the best out of regeneration for your energy without being irritated by the process, which has long been a bugbear for electric vehicles. Now, obviously, when you're designing a car that should look and feel futuristic, you have to make some hard design choices and, as they were pretty keen to point out to me when I took this out for a ride, it doesn't just have to work for the European market. There are an awful lot of global markets that give their feedback into this design. So, if you're like me, and the first thing you think is, ah, where have all the buttons gone? I promise you, a, well, at least according to Porsche, there are lots of customers who like that. Maybe you're one of them. Please let me know. But maybe it's because I'm old-fashioned. Maybe it's because I'm just not keeping up to speed. 
But I have to tell you, the options here are overwhelming and bewildering to me. I simply want to be able to access what I want quickly, efficiently, and in a straightforward manner. The driver's display delivers everything I want so simply, but this will do everything. Now, in order to make you feel that you still have the control in a regular way you understand, that is exactly what this display does here. Any time I see heating and cooling integrated into a digital display, it makes me shudder a little bit. Might just be my personal taste, but that is also experience. Now, this is a very up-to-date screen, so it has good haptic feedback, which means you don't have to look at it. If you can hear... Every time you make an impression on what of course isn't a button but feels like it is, you absolutely know that you have done that. Now that's heating and cooling where there's lots of other things we can do with this system too. I can raise the volume. I can drop, oh panic, panic, no rights, no rights. <laughs> I can drop the volume, hopefully quickly enough not to get sued by the author of the song. And I can change any of the individual settings that I particularly want to access. I do not find this intuitive to use, but again, it's important for me to state that could be personal to me. I'm really interested to see how people get on with it. And more than that, I can't wait to see if this is the future or if we will in fact be going back to having some dials and buttons. You know, I've tried all manner of different systems. I still think some things that are as fundamental as heating and cooling and volume, you just can't beat having the knobs but maybe that's just my taste. These air vents, which traditionally, as you would know from any car you've ever been in, you can manually adjust to get the air exactly where you want it. In this car, that is all electronically controlled. So the reason for this is that Porsche state that according to their research, people generally only want air in one of two places, either diffused throughout the cabin, so they are completely unaware of it being there, or immediately blasted at them so they experience the immediate cooling effect if it's a particularly hot day, for example. So let's say I want to change the way that works. Traditionally in a car, that would be pretty much the easiest thing you could do. Here is how you would do it in this car. I need to press this menu button, which then brings up the AC menu on this central screen. Now, I don't know about you, but there is nothing about that that looks intuitive to me. I have complete control, and that is massively impressive. And I have to say, if you sprung for the optional extra passenger display screen, that could well entertain them for a long, long time. But there is no way on the face of the earth I am adjusting that ever while I am driving. So maybe you don't think that's important to you. I would love to hear what you think. Now we come to the central part of the console. It starts down here, where you can see that we have a nice storage shelf. Obviously, that is the place where you're going to be putting your phone for charging. Slightly higher up, we are keeping in with the minimalistic, futuristic look with as little going on here as possible. Now we left these in here just to give you a sense of scale. That's the size this is in my hand, and you can see as it goes in there, it's really nice and solid, but there is plenty of room for something bigger. So I think that's a really clean, thoughtful piece of design. It's stylish. Importantly, it's very easy to keep clean. Those wells are nice and straightforward, and it doesn't interfere with the visual aesthetic of the design, which in this car is really paramount. So where does all the clutter live? Well, as you can see, I do have a perfectly adequate storage bin back here, and that has two USB access points and a 12 volt charge points for anything that you could want to pop in there. So wrapping up on the interior design, I think there are a lot of things that are very important going on here. This car had to be different from what had gone before. So whether you like it or whether you don't, if you're a massive fan of buttons, switches, knobs, and let's be honest, some Porsches have more buttons than you could ever need in one lifetime. I think this is a good starting point for this car. It's sleek, it's really, really nicely aesthetically designed to match the overall feel of the car and the interior, and nothing appears out of place here at all. Everything feels first quality, really great use of materials, but still a Porsche. I, for one, am very happy that this clock still sits here. And as long as it continues to do so, 
then I think I can live with everything else. This car makes an awful lot of bold claims. You would think, given the quantity of battery that has to be fitted into this, one, they may have chosen to have gone with a two-door, and two, you really wouldn't think there would be anything approaching usable space in the back for the rear seat passengers. Well, not only have they gone with a four-door, but that looks pretty good to me. Now, as far as styling is concerned, you can see that it perfectly matches the front. The rear seat experience is every bit as stylish as it is if you're up in the front of this car. But how's the comfort? Well, again, please bear in mind my very short legs, so this really isn't fairly representative. If I put my hand in front of my knee, if there was a six foot tall person with standard legs driving this car, the seat comes to around about here, so a good bit back. But I would say if you're a standard person with standard legs, you are going to be blown away by how much space there is available to you as a rear seat passenger. And what's particularly exciting about the way that the batteries have been applied to this space is that I still feel low in this vehicle. And as a rear seat passenger in a sports car, that's great. Now, do I have as much headroom as I would like? Well, you know, no, but come on. I'm not gonna sit in the back of one of these things and have unrealistic expectations. Just look at this. The battery storage compartment has been designed with this footwell in it, which Porsche, being German, describe as a foot garage within their technical details. I think it's quite a charming term and could catch on. Obviously, the fact that the batteries are down here does have some significant impact on the design. Here you can see what you might think is a heating and cooling vent. It's actually part of the thermal management structure for the batteries themselves. So again, how those batteries deal with heat is an essential part of their design. So whereas in a petrol car, you could open the door and throw whatever you want back here, you really are going to want to make sure those vents stay clear. As you'll have gathered from the front, this car is all about screens. So it's nice to see that that theme's been continued in the back for the rear passengers. A minor niggle, or at the very least, an adjustment to get used to back here is the fact that these heating and cooling vents, just like the front, are not adjustable immediately by the user. What you have to do is to select the way that you want to perform based on this menu. Now, as we said when we were in the front, Porsche's research says that people really only do two things with heating and cooling vents. They either want the air diffused, as you can see here, so that they don't notice and are not bothered by it, or they really want it full in their face, which is the way that you expect a lot of people like to use cooling when it's particularly hot in the summer. So they don't think that lack of additional functionality is something that you'll miss. I cannot wait to hear what you think about that. Being an old guy, I'm a little bit skeptical. I still think something I can adjust is gonna be my preference, but you have to admit, that does look pretty impressive. Now, believe it or not, on top of everything else, there is the claimed capacity to hold five passengers in this car. But I have to tell you, unless it's a small child or somebody really in desperate need of a lift, that is, of course, not going to be happening. But when you have a sensible four people in the car, the space is used well. You can fold down this armrest with these nice adaptive drinks holders in. And if you want to fit something a little bit longer or get access into the boot because it's raining too much, the whole midsection folds down to allow you that throughput or access to the back. All right, so far, the batteries are fairly cleverly concealed in the base of the car so we don't visually notice them. They put a footwell into the design so we don't physically notice them when we're sitting in the rear. So what does that mean for the boot space? Pretty impressively, 370 liters of load. Now, if you're wondering how that stacks up against other cars, that is very competitive with a standard hot hatch. And in a fully electric sports car, I think that's outstanding. I like these extra big bins they have at either side to dump your tools in. There is a little additional storage below here, but obviously that is where you're going to need to keep your charging cables. So don't get too many ideas about other things you can put in there as well. Nice to see the inclusion of a 12 volt charge point back here. That does suggest a nice weekend spent away camping with the car and if you have something bigger that you just need to get in, well, obviously you can fold down all of the seats to accommodate it. And as you can see, 
that almost goes flat and supplies a very reasonable boot for this type of car. Is it big enough for you? What do you think? Ordinarily, this is the point at which I would get very excited about showing you what's underneath here. But of course, in an electric car, that's largely hidden away. So, what we do find ourselves with are two mysteries solved. One, I guess this is where the charging cables have been put in this car. But secondly, you can see that we have a further 80 litres of storage space in the front here too. That is incredibly useful space. When you combine that with what's available at the rear, I have to say, I think you have more than enough room here for what most people could reasonably need. While we waited an awfully long time for this car, and a large part of that is that Porsche had to figure out exactly how they were going to apply the power that they wanted to a system that you as a driver could still recognize from, of course, those petrol internal combustion engines. Now, they eventually decided on an 800 volt system, and that is delivered via two motors, one at the front, one at the back. What's unusual is that the one at the back actually has two different gears to it. So that gives you a huge range of performance options and also massive amounts of available traction to control all of that power. Now, talking about power, of course you have the choice of either going with a standard or with the S version. That is going to give you around about 680 horsepower in the standard, but up to a whopping 761 in the S. All of that power is going to deliver you a 0 to 100 kilometers per hour speed of 3.2 seconds in the standard or an unbelievable 2.8 in the S model. 0 to 200 is going to take 10.6 seconds standard and 9.8 seconds in the S model. Now, it's not just about that raw acceleration power, you also get 890, sorry, 850 newton meters of torque in the standard, but an unbelievable 1050 for the S. So, what does 800 volts do to the charging situation? Well, it actually helps the car in lots of different ways. Not only does it mean that you can be much more flexible in terms of how you place the wiring loom, it is thinner, it's lighter, it's more flexible, you can do more things with it, but it also massively impacts on the charging abilities of this car. Now, there is a natural limitation on how fast you can charge it, but you should be able to go from 5% up to 80 in just 23 minutes. So those are really pretty impressive numbers. Well, we found a fairly straight bit of road. Let's show you what this car can do. First of all, Sport Plus. Now I should point out the major difference here is not only do you get the dynamic drive, but you also get the added noise. It's not my taste, but I'm keen for you to hear it and see what you think. And you can, of course, switch that off. A slight rolling start to make sure I don't interfere with the traffic and... Woo -hoo! Wow! Wow! What do you think, Jonas? <laughs> it's pretty good. Well, clearly we can't get close to what this car can actually achieve. We're not on a proper road. You can probably see we have a slightly wet surface, so we can't cope with any good high-speed steering either. But my goodness, that is a little flavor of what zero to 100 in 2.8 seconds can deliver. And it really is fabulous. Even if you're used to driving performance cars, it still comes as being extremely exhilarating. Best of all is the way that the traction delivers that power. You really can't compete with that experience in a petrol body. It just doesn't give you the same thing. Now that said, a huge amount of effort has been made here to deliver this experience in a way that will really resonate with big fans of the internal combustion engine. The most impressive bit of technology for my way of thinking is the braking. Why? Well, 90% of all braking is regenerative. That means it is being used to recharge the batteries and is actually not using the brakes at all. So much so that some of the brake calipers in this car have had to be specially treated because lack of use could cause corrosion. Well, that's a lot of fancy words. 
But what it boils down to is you would think that might really ruin the dynamic driving experience of the way that this car handles braking. Not at all. I challenge anyone to drive this car and tell me when brakes are being applied and when it is a regenerative, recuperative action that is being used to slow the car down. They both work so very well in concert that you just don't know. Having those two separate motors, one on each axle, not only massively helps with the balance of this very heavy car, but also delivers the power exactly where you want it. So when you put your foot down, it just moves. Now, I'm sure you'll be more than familiar with the idea that the most common problem for electric cars is thermal management of batteries. So, lots of cars can deliver very, very fast bursts of energy, but they can't do it repeatedly. The way that this car has been designed means that you can have that same burst of energy, they say, 10 times. Now, we've tried that out, and I've achieved more than that today alone. So, obviously, you're not going to be using that power all the time. What Porsche wanted to ensure is that it's there when you want it. And you still feel that you are absolutely in control. The amount of traction that's delivered with that power is sublime. And it results in a truly thrilling driving experience. Well, as we pull out from underneath this bridge, the first thing that becomes apparent is that they have dealt with the long running issue of how do you deal with a car that doesn't essentially make any noise at all. Now, it's been the law for a while in various markets that electric cars have to make a noise because several of them had run over people because they just didn't hear them coming. Well, in this car, you have a noise that is somewhat reminiscent, I would say, of a low flying saucer. Obviously, that's not a real thing, but I think that's the best term I can think of. Jonas, does that sound fair to you? Yeah. It's a little bit different to a standard combustion engine, and I think that was a really good choice. There would have been far too many cries of fake if you'd have decided to try and make it just sound like a standard car, which you absolutely could have done because most standard performance cars now have attenuation given to you through that stereo system anyway. Well, electric cars have always been popular for use around town, so we were always expecting this one would do pretty well. There are a couple of neat features here that really do add to your driving experience. The first of those is that this car comes as standard with three chamber air suspension, and that does really make for not only an incredibly comfortable ride, but also a very adaptive one. So as your driving style is changing between city driving, and then obviously somewhat more dynamic driving around the country roads, you will find that the car nicely matches your expectations. Obviously, the other thing that's key to your enjoyment of the driving experience are the driving modes. So how well do they deliver? Well, this dial that we have in the bottom of the steering wheel is absolutely great for changing them. You have five different available modes. Range, now, that is Porsche's new word for echo. I like it much better. You shouldn't be driving a car like this and be thinking of economy after all, but that is what we're talking about. So by calling it range, you are thinking first and foremost, how far can I get in this vehicle? Then you have standard mode, which should deliver you as much performance as you want when you put your foot down, but a comfortable, easy ride for when you're just cruising through. Then you have sport, that is as coarse as the name suggests, dynamic driving, sport plus, that is, yeah, but what happens if we make the car as sporty and dynamic as we possibly can? And then individual. Well, once we get a little bit of open road so we can see just what some of that power looks like when it's applied to the road, we'll show you. But until then, I think it's worth mentioning that the main difference in driving characteristics are just how responsive and aggressive the car feels. As you're driving through town, it's very pleasing to note that although this car weighs in at a fairly impressive 2.3 metric tons, that weight is brilliantly well managed by the suspension, the steering, and those motors. So although you really don't need to notice that weight in day-to-day -day driving, 
I can assure you, once you start accessing power in this car, you really are aware of it. Now, that isn't a huge amount bigger than a Panamera, not a huge amount. It is, after all, an electric car, but it does make a noticeable difference to your driving once you start taking it up to those higher speeds. Driver's display here is really helping me out. I have this very simply laid out. So it will tell me not only what the speed limit is, but also what my current speed is without me needing to navigate visually through a confusing lot of information. Here I have my navigation instructions. Personally, I would love that to be in the format of a head-up display, but honestly, this is working very nicely for me indeed. So you've had a lot of fun driving around in your Taycan, but now you realize it's time to give it a little bit more juice. Where's the best place to do that? Well, part of the Ionity network. Why? Because it's the fastest way of getting the juice back into your car. So there are AC charge points on both sides of the car, but if you want to access the DC one, then you will need the passenger side of the vehicle. There we are. It's a little bit wet, which might be why it wasn't quite so responsive there. It's just one swipe under there to open or close. As you can see, this flap lets you access the full DC charge. Now, we come over to here. I can show you the machine itself. It's really remarkably straightforward. All you have to do to use these machines is literally connected to the car, and then you will have, which you can get when you buy your car, one of these cards. There we go, Jonas can show you. That's obviously connected to the Porsche network. You literally just have to tap it to here and tell it to start. Now to make our best use of time, we have already charged this, but I do want to show you how the connector goes in just so you have an idea of how straightforward that is. So pick up the charger and then, there you go, one-handed operation. Really pretty straightforward. Forward. When you want to release it, you just push on this button to let the car know that you're going to be taking it out, and that's it. And then, to shut that flap again, there we go. Really very simple and straightforward. So, if you're down to 5% on this vehicle, you can get it back up to 80 at one of these charge stations in approximately 23 minutes. If that sounds like not the fastest thing in the world, if you ever go into a petrol station and time yourself, it's very difficult to do that in operation in any less than about that amount of time anyway. So I think realistically, if you live near to one of these or you can plan a route through the system which enables you to take advantage of these facilities, you are gonna have no problem in the world with dealing with the fact that you need to recharge your car. Can you please tell us who you are and what you do? All right, my name is Martin Riedelbach from the Taycan so-called Baureihe, which is the project management of the overall Taycan project. And there I'm responsible for electrics, electronics, also about charging, of course. That's one of the core, core features we have to bring in the market here with the car now. Yeah. Now, I, I think a lot of us already have a bit of experience with charging networks, and I have to tell you, some of those experiences are not particularly good. So when you looked at launching the Taycan, you didn't just want to use existing infrastructure there's a whole new system and there are lots of complicated reasons for that. Is, is that correct? Yeah, definitely. So when we decided to build that car and bring it really into the market, uh, it was very important from the beginning that we decided we also, we, we, we always think like our customers will have like 80% of the charging at home, but there's also 20% he's uh, underway on the road. And especially we want to build a car which is also able to have like long distance traveling. So uh, we, we really looked for um, like a cooperation to, to come up with a solution that you can charge the car on long distance travel. Um, so we um, decided to, to join the joint venture and come up even with the joint venture of Ionity. So we, we partnered with BMW, with um, Daimler and with Ford. And since two weeks, also the first Asian uh, OEM joined our joint venture, so Hyundai joined it. 
And so we are happy to be here at one of the first, let's say, I think 140 of these stations are already out there all over Europe. And we, we want to achieve about 400 stations in the mid-2020. The so you ha can have really a long distance traveling across Europe everywhere you want to. About 120 kilometers should be like the distance between two stops. Yeah. So just to be clear, you can use the standard EV charging networks that are available, but what's obviously special about this is that because the Taycan has an 800 volt charging platform, we can take a lot more out of that with a specific um, bespoke charging system. That's the Ionity network. Obviously, the partnering with the other manufacturers give that a lot more reach. Now, cost. I've just bought myself a Taycan. I haven't. I would like to have done, but I haven't. But I've just bought myself one. How do I get access to this? How does that work? Oh, actually, we decided, because charging is so elementary for the car, we decided that uh, the, the access to the so-called Porsche charging service is included for three years. Uh, so the first three years you buy the car. So it's, it's already included. So you don't have any extra cost if you want to charge at a energy charger. And you only get, get, uh, have to pay for the, the kilowatt amount, the energy amount you're, you're refilling. And uh, we haven't finally decided the, the final prices, but it's, at the moment it's a per session fee. It's, I think, eight euros per session, which is not, not that much compared to, to refill a car with fuel. And we will come up with a kilowatt hour price uh, quite soon. And this is, sh should be quite competitive compared to household pr electricity prices. Not that far, far above that. So to get a complete understanding, I don't have to use this network, but if I want to, it's going to be free to me in the first three years. And the reason that's a particularly good thing is it helps deal with the range anxiety issue. Why? Because you can plan your trip and using the car's systems, then you will know where your charging networks are available to you. And it only takes approximately 23 minutes from 5 to 80 percent. Is that correct? Yes, it is. With, I honestly, I stress if you use a standard charge at home, it's going to take a lot longer than that. But the idea is, to deal with people who often will complain that the infrastructure isn't in place, it's not ready, they don't have facilities to take an electric car on a longer trip, or if they do, the charging is too long, this is really helping to answer some of those questions, I think. Definitely. And one more thing to add, um, if you charge at home, we have a 8 kilowatt hour charger here, uh, onboard charger implemented in the car. So this helps to get fill in 8 to 9 hours. And so every night you will, if you want to, you get a, a full car in the, in the morning. So this is, this is for sure. And one more thing to add about the charging service. This does not only give access to the Ionity charging network, it also gives access about, I think we have now added about 100,000 charging points or poles all over Europe. Uh, a lot of them are uh, AC uh, charging, but also you, if you park somewhere in, in downtown, you you will get have, have access there and, and can pay with this service. So I think this is a, a good package for our customers from the beginning on. Yeah. Awesome. So if you if you have had experience of electric vehicles before and you're more than a bit nervous about the charging network, I have to tell you I have and I am. It's good to know that this is being baked into the design and implementation of this car. So it's not just been launched to market. How you utilize this technology, how it will work in the future is very much part of the design. Well, thank you so much for taking time to, to show us. It and a <laughs> it's all looking pretty great so far. Yeah, have fun with the car. In thank, the you. Bye. thank you. Thank you. Here we have a little bit more open road to show you how the acceleration works when you have it in Sport instead of Sport Plus. So select Sport. As you can see, I still have that pleasing surge, but it doesn't feel quite as dynamic. Although I have to tell you, I do enjoy not having the engine noise. Now I understand you can switch that off through the sub menus. The last of the driving modes is individual and that does offer you the opportunity to mess around with an awful lot of these settings. Now, some interesting information for you about the driving dynamic of this car. Again, it's 2.3 metric tons. That is not a light vehicle. So you would be astonished quite how well it handles once you get it into winding, bendy roads. I would have previously assumed that that was where that weight would cause the biggest issue. I was wrong. Not only is it almost undetectable because of what a great job the dynamic of the suspension working with the traction achieve when you're driving this car, but also 
it's just so much fun to drive you don't notice it where that weight is more significant and slightly concerning is once you get this car onto the open outer barn why well you can imagine once you see that road stretching ahead of you and you have no limit on your speed of course you want to put your foot down and take full advantage of it and that's all great but for two things because there isn't an engine here working massively hard to deliver it it just doesn't feel like you're going that fast you can drive absurdly fast in this car top speed 260 kilometers per hour and it just doesn't feel like it now we haven't taken it up to anything like that today because we have wet dangerous roads i think the fastest we've driven and unfortunately because of the rain we weren't filming would have been around about 185 190 believe me that was fast enough what was very significant to notice at that speed is what role the extra weight that this car has comes to play with well what i mean by that is you're used to driving quickly on the autobahn you're used to sports performance vehicles you're used to the way that their braking handles you can't cheat physics when you have that much weight being propelled through space at that kind of speed well needless to say it's going to take some time to slow down so although i've been very very happy and impressed with these brakes and they do an excellent job on this car you can't change the fact that it is a heavy vehicle so i can't help but wonder just a little bit whether there is the potential for an accident here because drivers are having so much fun they are so enjoying the drive they simply don't recognize how fast they're going and therefore when they decide they want to stop it takes a little bit more space than they've allowed themselves to do it but i could be worrying about nothing i am however very interested in your experiences and your opinions so if you've tried driving at speed in an electric car obviously i'm going to be thinking about the tesla i'm really keen to know how you found that braking experience did it work differently to what you were expecting from a standard sports car or was it actually no big deal at all let me know throughout your standard driving experience of this car you might think that you miss a lot of the components that you experience with an internal combustion engine the most obvious being road noise but the power is actually delivered in such a way in this car that even with the extra additional flying saucer noises switched off you still manage to get enough road noise for it not to feel strange the absence of the engine there's enough happening here to make you feel that you're in a car that feels very familiar certainly the way that the controls deliver everything to you makes you feel right at home but you still can really enjoy that little extra quality of quiet that the excellent sound insulation in the cabin combined with the obvious lack of engine deliver to you so clearly it's personal but i can honestly tell you that not once today when i've been driving this car have i actually missed the sound of the engine there's so much enjoyment to be had from the drive and if you're going to accept the fact that this is the future then i actually hope you would end up thinking of that more as a benefit than as a cost after all if you really stay up late at night when you can't sleep thinking about those deep throaty growly engines of old we've kind of already moved a little bit beyond those so for me you know what maybe i finally arrived at a time where i'm prepared to trade it all in for just a bit of peace and quiet the most common two words you hear when people are talking about electric vehicles are range anxiety and i think by waiting this little bit extra in terms of time Porsche have managed to assuage most of those fears. Largely because if you go with the standard model, you can now have an effective range of up to 280 miles on one charge. And if you go with the S, a little bit more power, you can affect 250. What I personally really enjoy about electric vehicles over their internal combustion engine counterparts is that when you get those numbers, those test numbers through from the manufacturers, they're actually reliable and accurate. That's not to suggest that the standard figures have been massaged 
more that the way in which those numbers are measured are more open to change determinant on how you're measuring them. With an electric vehicle, it's really very simple. How far can you drive on one charge? That's it. This vehicle, I can tell you, we haven't been particularly kind to today. We've made sure we've gotten the most from handling and acceleration, and we're still very comfortably within that range. So, realistically, you have to ask yourself, do you think you're regularly going to need to be driving further than that? And if you do, do you really think that it's gonna be such a problem to find a fast charging network to allow you to achieve that? Honestly, it's not a challenge now and that's only going to get easier into the future. So the real question here is, what are your reasons for not being prepared to go electric? Well, this car is the S. So this is gonna set you back around about 185,000 euro. That's a German market price. If you wanna go with the standard non-S model, that clocks in at around about 150. Now, those numbers sound eye-watering, but if you compare them to a well-equipped Panamera, suddenly they don't seem so expensive after all. So you have to ask what it is you truly love about the petrol engine. Is it the noise? Probably. Please try an electric car before you write it off as something that just isn't gonna work for you. I think you'll be astonished at quite what a good job has been done of bringing all of the characteristics of that drive of the internal combustion engine experience into an electric body. It really is quite remarkable to experience. And the raw power, well, it blows you away. So. Is this the most powerful electric car on the market? Does it have the best range of any electric car on the market? I think inarguably the answer to those questions is no. Do I care? Would I pick another car over this? Absolutely not. For me, this is the whole package. They've waited this long to bring this car to market because it delivers absolutely everything you could want. Now, car design is always a compromise. And for my taste personally, I think I would have liked it if they'd have gone with, say, a third less range and 25% less battery weight. That would have just sharpened the agileness of the handling and the responsiveness of the braking, whereby I really couldn't pick the difference between owning one of these and a 911. But ultimately, at the moment, still with electric battery vehicles, you are looking at range as being the number one determinant. People have to be able to imagine that they can take these on a long trip after all. Well, you needn't worry about that for too long because ultimately with the invention of solid state batteries, you're likely to see that weight loss coming in anywhere from two to three years after the launch of this vehicle. So this is just getting started. For my taste, I really like everything here. I think I would think about waiting until the head-up display comes out as well. I don't know how realistic it will be to fit that aftermarket, and it does make a huge difference to your enjoyment of the drive. It just makes sure your attention's where it's supposed to be while you are making the most of that power and that handling. I have to take my hat off to Porsche. This is one of the cars I have waited for with greater anticipation than any other I can think of at least in the last 12 months, and it has delivered on every single level. It's remarkable. What's most exciting about it is this is just the beginning. Now, I can't afford to buy one of these, and I suspect lots of you guys can't either. But the other thing that I find incredibly exciting about this is that all of these technological advancements will filter through. So we will over time be seeing similar, if obviously not identical driving experiences available to us lower down the price range. And when that happens, I think we all could be getting a little bit tempted. Well, that does it from us. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed seeing our experience here today. Please subscribe. If you have any comments or questions, please pop them below and we hope we'll see you all again soon.